I'm going to call to order the April 11, 2024, District 91 Board of Education meeting. May I have a roll call? Mr. Lyons. Ms. Angelo. Here. Mr. Brooks. Here. Ms. Tyler. Here. Mr. Rummel here. Ms. Cotton. Here. Ms. Wood. Here. Uh, for anyone who would like to participate, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Our mission, in partnership with Home and Community, is to educate each individual child in a safe and nurturing environment. We will foster respect and self-worth, teach skills relevant to contemporary life, and promote academic success and creative expression. We will encourage an appreciation of the rich cultural diversity of our community and instill a sense of wonder for the future to enable our students to become lifelong learners and responsible citizens of the world. Forest Park Public School District 91 will be acknowledged by all as a safe, a nurturing, and diverse learning community that establishes the highest standards for innovation and continuous improvement to achieve excellence and global citizenship for each individual child. Recognizing the systemic bias that has plagued our educational system, we commit to nurturing dialogue around all issues of inequity, including culture, race, faith, social, economic status, gender identity, sexual orientation, and different ability, as they pertain to classroom practices, school and school district structures, and policies and procedures. We support actions removing barriers to opportunities that will allow children to reach their full potential. Honoring Native American land. We, Forest Park Board of Education, would like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on the traditional lands of the Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, Sioux, and Kickapoo people and pay our respect to elders both past and present. Um, okay, for the board, oh, number four, consent agenda items. For the board, is there anything that you would like removed? Oh, I thought you were gonna say something. <laughs> okay, uh, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. A second. I'll second. Roll call. Ms. Angelo. Aye. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Ms. Tyler. Aye. Mr. Rummel. Aye. Ms. Cotton. Aye. Ms. Wood. Aye. Uh, number five, correspondence. Okay. Uh, number six, matters of consideration from the public. The Board of Education welcomes public comments at its meetings. This is the official time devoted to comments by community members. Following the public comments, the Board takes the citizens' comments under advisement. All speakers who wish to address the Board during this time must identify themselves before they speak. Comments are limited to three minutes per individual, and the Board asks that no specific names be mentioned in order to allow for the most efficient use of meeting time, if there are several speakers addressing the same topic, the board president may set a time limit for that topic. Any citizen wishing to address the board on a public matter is encouraged to contact the district office at 708-366-5700, extension 3301. According to the Illinois School Code, items such as those dealing with personnel, individual student discipline, the purchase of land, security, and legal actions may be addressed in executive section by the Board of Education. Okay, thank you, public. Number seven, superintendent report. Okay. I'm gonna start off um, my superintendent report with a uh, memoriam in recognition, change glasses. Arthur E. Jones, in the second, in recognition of Arthur E. Jones, the second, one of District 91's former superintendents. He was one of the youngest superintendents in Illinois when he started here at the age of 29. 
he proudly and thoughtfully led the staff and students from 1971 through 1984. He was highly respected by many Forest Park residents who still speak highly of him and his many accomplishments in Forest Park and beyond. David Novak. In recognition of David Novak, a longtime Forest Park resident, father-in-law of Jen Novak, our teacher, and an employee of the Park District of Forest Park. For nearly 33 years, he worked at the park as a superintendent of recreation and then became a director. He was also a D91 school board member serving from 1978 through 1984. He has left a lasting impression at the park and in the village. Karen Yarbrough. In recognition of Karen Yarbrough, Cook County Clerk. In fact, she was the first black person and first black woman to serve as Cook County Clerk. She had a career that spanned local and state politics over three decades. With gratitude, we celebrate her remarkable contributions that have made a lasting impact at the park and in the village. <laughs> Moving on to Assistant Principal Appreciation Week. In the first week of April, Assistant Principal Appreciation Week, we shine a spotlight on our one and only Assistant Principal, Kevin Bacon. Every day he leads with a blend of wisdom, compassion, and unwavering dedication, making Forest Park Middle School not just a place of learning, but a home of growth and belonging. We also celebrated National School Librarian Day on April 4th. On this day, we recognized and celebrated our two librarians, Mr. Hearn and Mr. Mills. We appreciate their dedication to our school libraries, but mostly for making our children fall in love with reading and for choosing the perfect book. April 5th, we honored our extraordinary paraprofessionals in our district. Their dedication, patience, and unwavering support play a pivotal role in shaping the lives of our students. Their ability to adapt, encourage, and inspire not only enhances the learning experience, but also builds a foundation of trust and understanding that supports our students' growth and well-being. And I have listed all of our paraprofessionals from each of the schools. Forest Park Education Summit Planning Committee. Thank you to all those that truly made the Forest Park Ed Summit su a success. Starting off with our coordinators, Rachel Ernst, Latoya McRae, Tiffany DePriest, and Danielle Sabatka. Thank you to our staff, Ms. Alaco, Ms. Jane Catazone, Mr. Maui, Jessica Barra, Ebony Murray, Tina Finanucci, Ellie Wynn, Lisa Parker Newman, Jose Montano, Michael Cork, Umberto Arciaga, Bob Ladadio, Robert Hubbard, David McHale, Jen Ullman, Victoria Aguizio, Brenda Ali, Jason Saxon, and Carlos Romero. Thank you to our students who volunteered to be room monitors, Nora Ernst, Nina Sakowski, Leiden Gerslick, Kaja Fowler, Ab Abriana Boyd, and Zah Zahira McRae. Thank you to our board who attended and all our families who were there to make this a special occasion. Finally, thank you to our Director of Engagement, Ms. Nudis Uceta Ramos, for our planning and work in getting the summit ready. Oh. <laughs> thank you. So today, our middle, scholars, middle school scholars are competing at the PMSA Middle School Math Competition at Proviso Mathematics and Science Academy. It started at 4 o'clock, and it goes all the way to 7 o'clock. We want to thank our math teachers for preparing our scholars, uh, Mr. Stiglitz, Ms. Stevens, Mrs. Uh, John Jackakumar, and Mrs. Joel J. Raj. Good luck to our 11 scholars, sending them positive vibes right now. I hope you guys all are with me, sending it to them. Um, I'll just name our children. So our eighth graders are Jason Snyder and Peekle. We have our seventh graders, Phoebe Thompson, Matthew Sk Skabinski, um, Kylie Bao, uh, Elias Jenkins, Audie DePriest, and sixth graders, Emilio Ramirez Rodriguez, Kam Kamara Brown, and Journey Jackson, and Lamont Matthews, Jr. So let's all send those vibes to them. And now moving on to our priority number one, learning and achievement, Ella, the ELLA curriculum. We have the committee here to speak about their journey and request later to approve SAVA's, my view, as the core K-5 resource. 
After our extensive evaluation process, including feedback and responses from teachers, the ELLA Curriculum Committee convened to engage in a consensus building protocol to develop an ELLA comprehensive core resource re recommendation. I will now have Director Edler come up and speak. Good evening, President Wood, members of the board, Dr. Alvarez. Thank you. Um, Forest Park community, my name is James Adler. I'm the Director of Learning and Innovation for the Forest Park School District. Uh, the last time a request was made for a new ELA core curricular resource was in 2016. That recommendation was in keeping with the expanding research around literacy at that time. Since then, significantly more research has confirmed what we know about how students learn to read using a systematic and explicit approach to teaching these, uh, those foundational skills um, associated with reading. Current research also emphasizes the importance of ensuring our ELA curriculum also develops knowledge-based skills. That is to say that both foundational literacy skills, as those you might associate with teaching phonics, as well as literacy skills critical for building knowledge such as development of vocabulary, writing, speaking and listening, and comprehension must be taught side by side with varying intensity and intentionality as students ascend from kindergarten through eighth grade. This research and evidence-based approach to teaching ELA is reflected in the recommendations that will be shared with you this evening by uh, members of the ELA committee. Uh, in May, we will return with an additional um, information to ask the board to approve the financial commitment necessary to provide the opportunity for every one of our students uh, to access world-class literacy instruction. Before I turn this over to the ELA committee, I want to underscore that these recommendations target our comprehensive core literacy instruction for all of our students kindergarten through eighth grade. So with that, I'd like to introduce and thank the representatives of the ELA committee who are here this evening, including Sarah Bocek, reading specialist at Field Stevenson, Rebecca Chardulo, uh, eighth, grade, uh, eighth grade ELA teacher at FPMS, and chair of the ELA committee and academic coach, Jennifer Allman. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Alvarez, community members. Uh, my name is Jennifer Ullman, academic coach, and just a little bit, I think James, uh, thank you for that introduction, because I feel like that really summed it up for us, but we have some awesome process and uh, to share with you this evening. Um, and I would like to express my gratitude. It's been a long and rewarding journey this process, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Alvarez very much, James Edler, for your uh, district leaders, for our visionary uh, leadership commitment uh, in cultivating an evidence-based uh, culture, driving continuous improvement in our district. Um, the renewed energy around curriculum committees is exciting. Um, within the past work, our four committees um, kind of led with academic coaches, are sparking conversations with our teachers and lifting best practices to um, just support better student outcomes and, and lift our experiences, so thank you. Um, with that, I have the pleasure of introducing our ELA curriculum committee. So you'll see pictured at the top, present here today um, from left to right. I feel like I need some music here. Um, we have Michelle Choice, uh, Garfield School uh, Reading Specialist. We have Rose Bodorf, also Garfield Reading Specialist. Uh, wearing our special education hat, Ashley Kern, a resource teacher at Field Stevenson. We have Jenny Ryan, third grade teacher at Field Stevenson. Um, we have in person, Becky Shardulo, eighth grade ELA. Uh, Sarah Bocek, reading specialist at Field Stevenson. We have Carmia Fuqua, our new reading interventionist who's joined us from the middle school. Um, and last but not least, Elizabeth Siri, second grade teacher at Betsy Ross. So I thank this committee, uh, I would say the dedication to our students, um, their passion for literacy is paramount, and um, I just applaud their, you know, their effort towards this process and their commitment. So this evening, we bring to you our committee recommendations for a comprehensive core ELA literacy program for the school year of 24-25. Uh, following our consensus meeting last week, the committee was surveyed to share a little bit about their experience and give us some feedback of the process. So you're gonna find some quotes within the presentation um, that came from all of the committee members. Uh, but we have Sarah and Becky here that are gonna share uh, a little bit of that on behalf of the committee. So I think the first two really wrap it up. And I think the first, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind. 
Um, I think that um, reading the quotes, it was interesting because some of them I know are not my specific quote, but they were almost some of the same same things that, that I said. Um, coming into the committee this year from the Social Studies Committee last year after I got the reading position this year, um, it was amazing to see how committed and dedicated everyone was and the interesting conversations that were going on and people from eighth grade trying to understand kindergarten and really having the time to talk about those things and really how everything aligns and everything works together. And have we had these conversations before? Sure. But having like dedicated space and time, um, the group was extremely dedicated. Um, and just it's just a wonderful opportunity to be a part of a district that gives us that time and all these teachers that work together to, to just build what we hope will really be a great decision for the district. Great. Sarah. So our work begins with a call to action. And this action came from the Illinois State Board of Education. There's urgency around literacy instruction in our country and in our state. Um, throughout this, uh, pardon me, I'm gathering my thoughts here, um, and statewide is to prioritize literacy instruction that reflects current research, evidence-based practices, um, as fundamental goals, because recognizing that reading is essential to all aspects of our students' lives. So the district, our committee responded to the call by diving into the initial Illinois State Comprehensive Literacy Plan that was released in July of 2023, attending listening sessions throughout the state and providing feedback to the Illinois State Board as well. Um, our goal is to align, enhance, unify our district's core literacy instruction practices with that of the State Literacy Plan, beginning with goal one, to ensure that every student receives high quality, evidence-based literacy instruction. I think I had a different piece here. So here's a little bit about our process. And I think this quote really shared that. So I'll show Becky. So the process, a lot of the stuff that we looked at did not exist when I started teaching 27 years ago. So it's definitely been a big change, a big shift in thought, a big shift in the whole belief and the growth of literacy from the first steps of letter recognition and sound recognition all the way to where we are in, in eighth grade where we're, we're putting literature in their hands and we're drawing connections between them and the literature and the rest of the world and creating their own pieces of work. So the process was very, very different. And I learned a whole lot. I learned so much about kindergarten. And I <laughs> learned I am where I belong. <laughs> <laughs> but it was actually very illuminating to sit down with the kindergarten, first, second grade teachers and really kind of dive into what their what they're responsible for and just how amazing it is that this is where the building blocks of literacy start in our district and to see what they start with and how it what it turns into throughout the course of the years and when they hit when they get to me in eighth grade so it was a really remarkable experience and I really do appreciate the opportunity to sit down with all of my colleagues I've, I've met I've worked with my sixth seventh and eighth grade colleagues before but this it's been a long time since I've had the opportunity to sit with K through two and three through five, and just see how all the pieces fit together. And that's what this curr these curriculums do. They fit together and they fill in blanks that we needed and really meet the goals of the Illinois State Plan. Thank you. A little bit about our work this year, starting in October, diving, taking a deep dive into that 130 page document, right? Starting with goal one, section one, really trying to understand those shifts in, you know, of the, evidence you know, of the literacy research, but also of the state plan. So really diving in, aligning our recommendations um, with that of the state. In November, we really took a deep dive and audit into our curriculum, you know, our landscape of, of literacy in the district, um, not just from data, but of resources, and it exposed some gaps. You know, there's some gaps. And then diving back into that research and plan and you know, creating a list of non-negotiables that was gonna help elevate and lift our practices. Um, in December, we reviewed um, from publishers, feedback from local districts. Um, we brought in you know, our non-negotiables to really look at the programs that were out there um, that would align and, and, again, elevate. And then between December and January, we put a lot of time and energy into creating an in-depth evaluation tool. So this in-depth tool, um, again, aligned with the expectations of the state and our non-negotiables to make sure that we could bring the best possible resource to our students and teachers. Uh, that brings us to February, the big task. 
evaluating the resources. So bringing those down, we took this into three stages, 11 indicators, and a lot of evidence. So the commitment to the committee and to, you know, again, finding that best resource um, and fitting our non-negotiables. So that brings us to all the while keeping that comprehension literacy plan, diving into the additional goals as well. Brings us to our non-negotiables that we mentioned. So when we looked at those gaps, kind of exposing the gaps, we identifying the research, we really looked long and hard, creating these together, what we really needed to elevate our practices. And so these helped guided our work, helped focus as we evaluated the need for students to, opt, you know, to engage in volumes of text, both print and digitally, to increase their vocabulary, to increase that practice, the, complex need, uh, the text needed to be complex, that means at their grade level, it needed to, to span various genres, literary, non-literary, um, all the while, students need to be talking, thinking deeply, and being able to respond uh, to what they're reading through their speaking and writing. Writing was a big piece, you know, connecting that. It should not be isolated. It needs to be embedded with the reading. We need to be writing about what we're, we're reading um, and share our knowledge. And then last but definitely not least was the foundational skills, as James had mentioned earlier, that need to be explicit instruction and systematically applied. And that really is the shift with that science of reading as well. So those were our non-negotiables guiding our work. And in here, that process, this is a little image of the tool. We shared some links with you to kind of get an idea of what that rubric looked like. Um, it, that, along with our non-negotiables, created the three stages. So when we evaluated the resources, we were looking at instruction pedagogy, that gradual release, best practices. We were also looking at the literacy standards as well as usability, really taking into account our multilingual learners, differentiation, we were looking at assessments, you know, needs that again were exposed, those gaps that were exposed that we need to elevate. So we were looking very hard in the process of the evaluation. So following the evaluation process, we were able to narrow the field down to three. It was kind of like our own March Madness, so it was pretty exciting. Um, so the three comprehensive core resources for consideration, um, as we became down to our decision, it was a consensus building pro uh, protocol. So I'm going to share the quote a little bit. Um, I didn't know if Sarah would be willing to read the quote because I oh, thought sure. this was intense. Um, choosing a curriculum is a tough process that required constant conversation, deep diving, and reinvestigating curricula in order to come to a consensus. So coming to a consensus is not like a vote. It's not your favorite. We're not comparing apples to oranges. It is truly... Um, these were, the, these were the consensus that you could choose. So this was part that our teachers were a part of as well as our committee members. It was one, I, yes, with an unqualified yes to this decision. Or two, I can find it acceptable. Three, I can live with that, not especially enthusiastic. Four, I do not fully agree, um, but I would not block it. And then five, I do not agree, that we need to really look for, you know, further to explore. So this was a little bit of the picture of the pie there about some of you know, what that consensus looked like. So again, all participants had a voice in this, and I think that's what made this process really unique. They felt valued and heard, and I think this is what made it different from any other process of developing curriculum before. Um, so this was neat to see from our teacher standpoint and from our committee, um, and, but really holding true with our non-negotiables. So although we did not agree unanimously um, initially, uh, this process really guided our work, and we were selecting the program with the most enthusiasm and the least negativity. And I think that was, you know, the, the end game here. So teacher surveys. Following our evaluations, all of these programs went on tour. We delivered these to the schools by grade band, and the teachers had the opportunity to take their own deep dive, uh, give their consensus, as well as any additional feedback. And this was a quote from the teacher, and, and I think that speaks volumes of the committee and, and the work as well, their confidence. So teacher surveys and recommendations. There was a couple quotes that really stood out. Um, I think with Savis, the big feedback from the teachers was they recognized it as rigorous, complex text. They saw an award-winning digital platform with ample evidence and practice through inquiry-based learning that would best serve our students and amplify ELA was acknowledged as a program designed for middle schoolers. It is rigorous, engaging, amazing graphics, digital library, immersive quests um, that allowed students to collaborate with their peers and engage in both print and digital. So with that, this is exciting. 
You know, believe the long become. We're going to bring our channel, our inner Ted Lasso here. Um, this this quote really spoke volumes as well as we all walked away with a better understanding. And I think Becky mentioned this at the beginning, not just of our own grade level expectations, but the sequence of skills in literacy. So I feel like we need a little bit of a drum roll. All right, here we go. Okay, with a consensus, 75% enthusiastic, 25% said, oh yeah. We got this. Savis, my view, 2025 for K to five is our recommendation. And Sarah, I'll leave it to you and a little bit of some of those things here. Um, yes, there were a few that we were down to and we really went in and there was definitely a lot of back and forth discussion about this one. What about this one? Looking at the minutes that we have, you know, to teach kids and making sure we could give like the entire um, series, like really teach the whole thing and not have to leave things out. So we wanted to make sure we weren't cutting out writing or cutting out phonics or cutting out things in order to fit what we have. And we also looked at the time we spend in our classrooms and looking at expanding some of that time in third to fifth grade. So we've really looked at a lot of pieces of, of this and we felt that my view fit that for our students. Um, Another series had a little bit more, it felt like direct instruction seat work, and it just seemed like something that we've been trying to go a little bit away from, you know, more breaking it up into smaller pieces. And in this um, series, it felt maybe more engaging with the students and the text. It's like highlight right here in the book, right there in front of them. They can be involved in what we're doing. So if we're reading the story and then we're learning about a certain skill, that skill is right on the page, and they can be a part of what we're doing and not just sort of sitting and feeling like a passive learner. So that really stood out to me personally. Um, it seemed rigorous, the, the text, uh, the vocabulary, um, that stood out to us. Um, and we, you know, the primary teachers, we asked them like, do you like the way the phonics is taught? Do you think that it's appropriate in the order and sequence and the way things are? And they agreed that, that it really was. So this is what we decided on. After a lot of discussion, I, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that lot. quick, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So our second drum roll as we bring our recommendation is, here we go, a 100%. So this was unanimous for Amplify, ELA, and 6 to 8. And here are the highlights and some of the, the features. So Becky, I'll let you share. So Amplify ELA is a specifically designed for sixth through eighth grade. It is a middle school program. A lot of the sixth through eighth grade programs run from sixth through twelfth grade. A lot of them go into the high school and sometimes they're not necessarily completely developmentally appropriate or some of the uh, material wouldn't necessarily resonate with our students. But Amplify is designed for our toughest audience those sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. It has a lot of content that they can really see themselves in. It's very reflective of our student populations. Uh, it does include classic works as well as more modern contemporary works. It also, as Sarah was saying, with the um, constraints of timing and with the school year, uh, quite a few of the other six or eight programs had 180 day strands where you had to start on day one and you went every day for 180 days to get all the materials in. As much as we would love to do that, we know that's not completely possible. We want to be able to have celebrations, field trips, field days, these moments where the kids can be kids and do things other than working on the curriculum. So Amplify provides a 100-day strand so we can get all of the materials that would be covered by any of our testing, PSATs, IAR, within that 100 days, which still gives us the flexibility for celebrations, for things like the Poetry Slam, which is, and it also, by the way, also has a Poetry Foundation connection as well in Amplify, so I was kind of excited to see that. Um, so there's a lot of that as well. Amplify was 100% yeah. accepted. It includes a standard-based grading. It is already connected to standards-based. All the assessments are graded on standards-based strands. And um, it also includes embedded tier two and tier three supports with ELL supports and a v digital library, so like a Kindle library, that has hundreds of books available for free for the students to download. So if a, our library doesn't have a book, it's probably on Amplify. And they add dozens of titles every month, if not hundreds of titles. I think there's a couple thousand yeah. titles in it. Yeah. I, 700. Uh, yeah, <laughs> at least uh, that's close to a thousand, yeah. which is right. a lot. Yeah. So we, d we have that. They also have, in addition to um, the regular units, I think there's six units, they have these quests 
which are interactive quests. And honestly, I kind of want to do the seventh grade one in the last week of the year just to try it out and play with because it's an Edgar Allan Poe one that I didn't get a chance to do last year with them. And it's literally like an Edgar Allan Poe whodunit murder mystery. And it's, got, it's really cool. I'm, like, I'm kind of excited about it. I'm a little jealous I don't get to do it, but that's okay. Keep me in eighth grade. But <laughs> <laughs> honestly, I'm kind of looking forward to this. And if I'm a little nervous about the online platform, but I'm willing to take the dive in and check it out. I think it'll be really great for our kids. And it completely dovetails into what Savas is doing at the K through five level as well. So there we, we won't see any of those gaps. Thank you, Becky. Amazing. We've shared some resources attached. There are videos that share the shifts, program overview. Um, we've provided the digital login, demo login for you to explore as well. So take a look. We've shared some resources outside both of the middle school Amplify, and then we brought in the Savis as well. Um, we are just so excited. Uh, we enthusiastically recommend, um, we appreciate our board um, for your commitment to uh, literacy success in our district and just enhancing our student experience all the way around. It's been exciting uh, to watch and all that's happening in our district. Uh, these are some images of literacy. Literacy is meaningful in D91, from our community books to literacy nights, uh, poetry slams, uh, you'll see the eighth grade had an anthology published, so we shared that um, outside as well. So we had that right uh, just prior before spring break. So um, lots of exciting happenings. Um, we appreciate your time this evening. We really wanted to share. We don't get to be up here often and in front, and uh, there was a lot of time and energy into this, and um, we appreciate your consideration. So thank you. All right. Did I bring it to you? Do we have any questions I need to ask? Yes. Please. <laughs> um, I'm curious about, so let's say that you have a first grader, and let's say that you also have a sixth grader. How might um, those families experience the, the new curriculums for their kids the next year? I assume that Etta Betta and her super kids friends are no longer, right? Yes. So we will <laughs> yes. we'll say goodbye to those. Scamps. Oh, wow. More, yes, there may be yeah. that. Yes, we'll Little scamps. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> exactly. We probably should have like there will be a, fair a little well. moment of silence mm -hmm. for the for super sure. kids. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, we have looked hard, long and hard with our reading specialists at the scope and sequence, especially, you know, something about the Sabbath program that we're super excited about is that vertical alignment. We have not had that in seven years, a K to five. And that was unheard of. You know, in, in, district, in our district previous, we always had a K to five. And that explicit systematic instruction is going to be better aligned. So our uh, specialists working with Rose and Michelle uh, specifically and, and Ms. Westall at Betsy Ross, they've looked at the scope and sequence and kind of seen some shifts that we might need to focus on to make sure our first graders are, you know, we're going to close that gap and make sure that, you know, when we begin... Um, hopefully with this new program, we're going to be able to know what, where to start them off. As far as for our middle school, Becky, do you have anything, I think, with the, currently it's teacher created? Uh, currently the yeah. curriculum is teacher created based on the standards. Uh, each 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, grade teacher has created their own curriculum curate, that we've curated over the years. Uh, middle school has always kind of been its own monster, and it's a natural break between 5th grade and 6th grade. So it's very understandable to have a different curriculum from 5th grade to 6th grade. Most of the districts that we talked to, they had one curriculum from K through 5, and then another curriculum picked up from 6th through 8th, because it's just a natural breaking point. And it does dovetail. Honestly, we looked at the scope and sequence, and where uh, Savas, we, Savas actually was our second choice, believe it or not, in the middle school. Um, but we liked the print digital, the print and digital um, interchangeability with Amplify a little bit better than Savas. In the middle school, MySync was very clunky and it was all digital. And we do want to be able to give our students that ability to pretty much code switch between print material and uh, digital material as well because we don't know uh, so many of our students scatter at the end of the year in eighth grade that we are not we, we need to prepare them for every possibility in high school if that makes sense I think that's the enhancement of mm -hmm. the digital platform yeah. I think that's going to be more seamless currently there really isn't a digital platform they cannot access their text you know digitally and having their programming there so I think this six to eight program is going to offer so much more you know access to the library access to that digital component, they're going to be able to see their standards, their scores, the auto 
scoring, right, their standards, how well they're doing. Um, so I think that digital component is going to be a huge enhancement. Really quick, you made a comment that you were concerned about the, the digital platform. Is that because it's not well-based today and this is going to be uh, a little bit more prevalent? Well, with the 608 Savas, it was all digital. Okay. So there was no, there was no, there was nothing we can actually put in the kids' hands. And sometimes you really, you need to highlight, you need to underline, you need to be able to, you know, dog ear that page to go back. So you do sometimes need to have those physical materials in your hand for some of these skills. So that was, that was one of our concerns with sure. that. Okay. There's something to be said to put pen to paper. And the journaling, the writing, they have their own individuals. I think Savis was really clunky. It was a massive book. We could not imagine our oh, students yeah, carrying uh, this yeah. or logistically housing it. Yeah, if you got a book, it was it, it was, and then tearing it out. And then you're, you know, you're, this, the cost of the resource of tearing that out, uh, you're going to see, if you go look at the Amplify, just how clean, the, you know, those journals are. And how we could see those more, just much more functional. And I think that was the piece. And much more realistic. They're going to be excited. We're excited. It was all, you know. Yeah. The dashboard. Oh, it was clean. It's yeah. much cleaner. Not as big. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ladies. Oh, can I? Oh, I'm so Go sorry. Ahead. I just had a question when you said the students. Are student voices considered in the evaluation process? Question. I think with the, within that, I think it's showing the text. You know, currently we have, um, we use a Savvis product right now that really spoke to our three to five with using that. I mean, I can tell you as even using Savvis uh, with that, the, the stories that these students remember. These books are relevant, they're engaging. Um, uh, the platform is amazing. Um, and I think that digital access, I'm excited for K to two to be able to see all that interactivity, the multilingual access, um, the stories there that are engaging. Um, I think it's going to really. I, 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 can, I can speak to, from teaching the third through five curriculum. And so I used to just teach third grade, and the kids loved the stories. They were really engaging. And when we found out we're switching a little, I'm like, what are we going to do without the case of the gasping garbage? You know, And the kids would be kind of laughing. And then this year, as a reading specialist, I'm in rooms all the time, and I'm seeing them like using that vocabulary in the next year. like. I'll say, oh, don't you remember that from this? And they're all like, oh, yeah. And it just like clicks, and then they all start talking about this. So it does really vertically align, and the stories are very engaging. And then when we were flipping through the materials, mm -hmm. um, for, for my view, some of our favorite stories for third grade are actually back for those. So I think they selected some of the same stories that have been successful, which I was excited about, because some of the stories were more engaging than others, um, and the ones that we really liked um, are in there. So that's good. And I think with the Amplify, mm -hmm. Becky, you shared that with the students. So she kind of piloted um, a little piece of that. And I think that was, you know, the kids in, were able to get on digitally, really like the sync. I think your Romeo and Juliet component was there. And a lot of Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on to our five E's that is now has been closed. Our student response rate, uh, Field Stevenson at 91% and Forest Park Middle School at 97%. We're going to move on to family community engagement. Our parent response rate for five E's, uh, again, the survey was closed March 29th. Uh, Betsy Ross at 76%, Field Stevenson 80%, Forest Park Middle at 58%, and Garfield at 68%. And um, it truly was a treat to see our eighth graders doing a spoken word for their families. Ms. Rebecca Chardulo, who is here today, provided a wonderful event for our children to showcase their talent on World Poetry Day. Our MC was Trey Baker, a student I met when he was a senior in high school, and now is a two-time Emmy-nominated storyteller, award-winning spoken word artist, author, Chicago Action Team at the Obama Foundation, and Youth Outreach Coordinator. And our children were nothing but exceptional. And some of the poetry was very deep, it was very personal, and overall beautiful. 
And so I'm very proud of the following students. We have Akram El Sharif, Maeve Leahy, Jason Snyder, Jamari Ward, Carly Figueroa, Michael Taylor, Emmy Whitebone, Nina Sadillo, uh, Aiden Leonard, and Celine Wazelovic, uh, Ali Aliana Zayas as, as well. If we could give them a hand. It, it, it takes uh, courage to go in front of everyone and kind of go to your deeper thoughts, and especially if your parents are in the crowd. <laughs> and um, so we want to thank uh, everyone and all our families who have already registered for the coming school year. Remember, you must submit all of your registration materials by May 31st. Otherwise, you'll be asked to register as a brand new um, family and have to submit all your documents of residency. And returning students register via Infinite Campus Portal by May 31st, and new students via the website um, www.forestparkschooldistrict.org. And here is our short promo uh, video to inspire you to register now, including my board members with returning students. Just check, checking on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> And moving on to our Forest Park Education Summit recap. I can't emphasize enough the outstanding success of the Forest Park Education Summit. It began with an exhibition fair in the gymnasium, followed by an exceptional opening address by our Forest Park District 91 parent and CAC member, Monique Nor Norrington Joseph. The summit featured 10 breakout sessions led by top-notch presenters, including some of our teachers, and concluded with a keynote speech from Forest Park resident community organize organizer, Betty Almazora, Alsamora. Um, everyone who attended gained new insights, shared knowledge, and engaged in meaningful conversations. We strengthened connections, deepened our understanding, and collaboratively shaped Forest Park's future, creating a sense of belonging for all. It was evident the immense effort Director Uceta Ramos and her engagement ensemble invested into this significant event, an initiative we hope will become a cherished tradition. And moving on to talent recruitment and development. Our teacher response rate um, is Betsy Ross, 100%. Field Stevenson, 90%. Forest Park Middle School, 95 And Garfield, 92 These are our highest so far. So it was wonderful to see these numbers. And um, there was no FOIAs. Oops. That's it. Just one thing I wanted to, to say thank you for for the Poetry Slam. There was the, the booklet. They actually published a book of all of the students' poems. So whoever, who, it's, it's, that, that was awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. And Arbula. out in the community, when your kids brought it home, go read that thing. And not just your kids. Read through it because you will get a really good sense of, of what the kids in the community are like thinking and feeling and things like that. It was a really, it's a, it's a, it's a nice book. Like It's physically a nice book. Um, and there's a lot of cool stuff in there. So, yeah, it, can, She's going to bring it out. Mm. We could show it to the audience. And I think that, and if I'm not mistaken, the work in there was presented the way the students turned it in, like the font, so, whatever they picked. So the kids who wrote like mm -hmm. free verse where it's like one, you know, so. If you, if you got one of these, read it. I have. <laughs> so thank you again. Thanks for bringing it up. Okay, number eight committee reports. A, teacher negotiations. It's myself and Ms. Tyler. Uh, we are not there yet, but it's not too far off. Uh, board policy, Mr. Brooks, Ms. Angelo. We have a, we have a long list of things. Yeah, we do. We, so we're, we're looking into our AI um, policy. Um, we started off providing, um, well, we, we're tweaking it because keep in mind it's 13 plus um, and, and older for this. And so we ended up giving a survey first to our administrators and all district level to provide feedback. And then now we have sent it out to our, the rest of our staff. Uh, did the principal send them out to you guys already? 
Okay. There was one response already on there. So um, they'll be sending it out to them then. Um, and so once we have all their responses, the policy committee is going to meet, look at it, tweak whatever we need on there, and then hopefully get a revision that's suitable for D91. Um, the other policy that we have, I believe I had it on here. Oh, a discussion of Public Act 103 uh, A school district may adopt a policy to waive tuition costs for non-resident pupils if the pupil is a child of a district employee. So we're looking to um, amend this so that board members could, um, so the board can amend this policy so our staff could bring their children to D91. And then we have a, a packet coming in. Thank you. Finance, uh, Mr. Lyons, Ms. Angelo. Uh, we are scheduled to meet, I believe, on Monday the 22nd. Engagement, uh, Ms. Cotton and Mr. Rummel. Uh, after the education summit, we don't have anything additional to report. It was well covered during the superintendent's report. <laughs> Uh, superintendent evaluation, Ms. Cotton, Mr. Rummel. Uh, that's that's done and was reported last month. Uh, PPC is myself, um, but Dr. Alvarez is oh, yeah. going to give the report. Um, so we had a PPC meeting. Um, there was one item on there just asking about roles. Um, for an infinite campus and grading, who should they go to? Um, the personnel handbook is there. It did not have for infinite campus, but they have been told to go to um, Ms. Jessica Barra for that and as well for grading as well. Uh, CAC, Mr. Brooks, Mr. Lyons. CAC is going to meet next week. It's going to be the last big planning <laughs> meeting before we have the big meeting. And there have been a lot of committed um, sort of stakeholders in the community and the staff um, that I just want to send a personal thank you to for um, the level of commitment to the meetings and um, the insight that they provided to um, Dr. Alvarez and, and staff. Um, so I believe the meeting is set up for the 15th. Yeah. Of, mm -hmm. yeah, the yep, 15th, 15th of May, that is when uh, the final presentation will occur. So once again, thank you so much. And the Grant White Leasing Committee is myself and Ms. Angelo. Yeah, we had a meeting this last week on Monday, and we did talk about uh, some lease details. The proposed plan is to make the first floor available for lease and the second floor designated for um, offices for our use. Uh, it covers roughly 1,800 square feet. Uh, we would the hours of operation for a tenant would be dependent on the lease, and uh, any improvements that they would make also uh, would be temporary, removable, nothing structurally changing. Uh, we discussed maintenance and repairs and uh, lease terms. Um, we would do short-term contracts, or we are doing short-term contracts uh, for residents and local organizations right now. And if you have any other questions, we did bring Bob Ladadio here. <laughs> Just one question. When we're talking about the first floor, would give, like the gym and the stage in the gym are probably the biggest resource that we hear people asking about. Is that something that, as we're talking about leasing the first floor, we would still be able to you know, borrow it back if we needed for, for different events? Or is that, is that something we're talking about? Or we're not that far yet? We're not that far yet. Gotcha. We're, Thank we're you. still working on that. And did anyone have any questions about the structure, how the building is? Mr. Ladadio is here and happy to answer any questions. I don't know that I have any questions, but do you have anything that you might want to share about? Thank you. Yeah. Hold on, hold on, Bob. I don't need this. I got a big mouth, <laughs> as you all know. Um, we have, we do our. It's a life safety ten year, but that's really not. We do it every year. Every year the ROE comes out, inspects all our buildings. I'm going to give you guys a little printout of what they look for. They come out and check all this checklist stuff out, like the boilers, the the flame um, proof on the curtains, the elevators. Um, goes through everything. 
So I, every year, we, this is done by them. This year, I didn't have them do this building because they said they're not going to do it. We had no kids. But I did have them come back. They're, I know the people there. I have called them back to have them come back because I figured we're going to have kids here. We're all set to go. This building is in good shape. It's all completely passed on everything. I got a boiler certificate. All the certificates are up to date. We got backflow certificates, sprinkler. So I have it here, a copy. If you guys want to look, I'll just give it to you guys. You guys can look at it whenever. And I also just have our existing conditions from our last 10 years. And that shows you how our water main, how big our water main's coming in. The only thing I think we're going to have to address, and I'm going to do that before we even lease this building or whatever we do with it, is we got one compressor out. I'm going to change that compressor out within the next month. It's, it, it's not going to be that bad, but it'll be a few thousand dollars. But otherwise, we're good to go here. Does this building need work? It's just like your house. I mean, the boiler could go down. We have an old boiler, but we do have a newer boiler. So, yeah, you could get something wrong, but I'm telling you, for three years, we're going to be fine. You, won't have to, you, you could put money into it, and you might have to. But right now, we're good to go for the next few years if you want to lease it. And it's, occupancy could start tomorrow with kids. We could have kids in here tomorrow. So I'll just give you these things if you want to look at them later. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <laughs> um, something to do. I know you know. Right. <laughs> we also discussed a timeline. Um, we were thinking of trying to get the lease together so that parties could lease starting in August of 2024. I'm sorry. That we were thinking that we are trying to get the lease together um, so that we can have parties uh, begin leasing in August of 2024, this August, I think. So it's our, it's our lease. We're not asking. People aren't bringing their lease to us saying, hey, can we lease it? Here's a lease. It's we are saying this is our lease. You can sign it if you want to. Correct. I will say um, I think currently in my head, and I admitted that in the committee meeting that I think about, um, the park and the village were here. Um, also, we had, uh, after the last board meeting, Dr. Alvarez did let the park um, know that the 30-year proposal for them and WSSRA was not going to work out. So they are aware. But we did say, we will let the park know when we're ready with the lease so that if they need space, that they can still be included in that. When we consider lease terms, it's this is obviously a uh, not for profit, right? Like we are not doing this for profit, so it would just be like maintenance and utilities, things like that. Yes, a percentage of utilities. I'm yes, assuming. so it would. Um, the idea that was we discussed was dividing it if it's just the first floor, and if we have uh, one person leasing the whole first floor, they will pay half the utilities and half the maintenance, and then the district will pay the other half as we will be using the second floor. If it's two entities using the second floor, I mean the first floor, it would be a quarter each for them. And then, yes, yes, no and then. Um, if we're gonna be using the second floor for district staff that's currently here, are there any changes that will need to be made? Like structural, not, I know we're not making big structural yes. changes, but to configure space. Okay. That's it. There is. We talked about um, different rooms, and we looked at if we divided them into offices, what it would take. Um, as the high estimate was maybe just about thirty-five thousand dollars. If we wanted to build some offices and do some reconfiguration up here, it'd just be putting up port uh, um, partitions in different walls. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 Ms. Soledadio said it'd be just metal stud drywalls like we did in the district office that we currently have. Okay. okay. So. Just a follow on question to that, and it's if it's too complicated, I can you can answer next time. But so as we're talking about putting thir like thirty five thousand dollars into making changes up here, can we recover that from the leases that we signed for tenants downstairs so that we still come out more or less even without like damaging our status as not for profit and 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 getting down that. Well, it depends on who we rent out to, but if we're splitting the cost of the maintenance and the utility bills, well, that's some savings on our end right there already. So we'll be having some savings there. But if it's a non-for-profit, we're most likely not charging them anything. 
just the yeah. cost of the the maintenance net. So we'll be saving money on that end because currently we're paying it ourselves okay. the, the building. So for for any lease that we do end up signing, I would assume that there's going to be financial statements. We would see like an analysis saying, hey, these are the leases that we're looking at. And this is what it's going to net out to in terms of savings for the school district Correct. or non-savings, whatever. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think for me, just clarification, I think on uh, Ms. Tyler's uh, comments, are we sectioning off access that it's going to be locked access that the people from the least first floor do not have access to the second floor and making sure that any valuables or things that we have up here are not accessible to anybody that's leasing the building we can with the dividing walls the fire doors that are there we can make sure that there's locks on there for us and we can also put alarms on them such that if someone opens them it signals an alarm because there's some on each side of the hallway if they're coming up the stairs have we given any thought to hours of access you know i mean we're so used to well we're here tonight but generally speaking there's nobody here really past four or five In so what are we thinking about that in the sample lease that we had, it, it did have hours of access. And I believe in the sample one, it was 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. That was Monday through Friday. If they wanted use on the weekends, they had to put in a special request. So when we talked about that, we said depending on who the, the leasee is, we would work that out with them and see what would those hours of access be. And does anybody who leased the building also have access to parking and the playground? That would be determined by the lease. So we'd have to write that in if we want to give them access. Okay. <laughs> I could, you know, I could ask. Them okay. What, one last question for for an entity that occupies the building, just to dovetail on this, where they may be here later than typically district staff are. Um, would we also be putting into leases things like? Like now we have extra janitorial staff in the building because we're here and they're going to stay here till we leave. And we do that whenever we've used the building for anybody else. Is that, I assume we're going to have something similar in place so that if somebody's in the building later than normal business hours, there will be somebody from the district here to make sure it's, you know, and to John's point, nobody's coming up here doing anything or if there's spills, damage, whatever. And that is, we talked about that during the meeting okay. that um, we want our custodians still cleaning the building. So that'd be part of the cost they split. So it's okay. just like if anyone uses the building after our, outside those hours or on weekends, it'd be our custodians coming in and they'd cover that cost of that individual. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Number nine items for discussion, Dr. Alvarez. I'll start off with the social media um, litigation. There was an update of the social media litigation webinar today. Uh, there are 970 schools throughout the nation right now, part of the litigation, and 74 of them are from Illinois. The goal is to protect our students, modify conduct, because we know that social media is not going away, and get reimbursed for any district damages. And what are damages? It's looking at like if we had to hire new positions or actually place a curriculum because of uh, issues with social media. And they are asking all districts to fill out a plaintiff fact sheet that is due on April 19th. This fact sheet was developed by the defendant, so obviously. <laughs> um, but um, they were able to bring it down to 45 pages. Oh. Mm -hmm. okay. So we have to fill out 45 pages. Okay. Um, one of the questions was, uh, personnel from 2017 all the way to present uh, who would know of any issues regarding uh, social media that may have caused anything with children. Um, so you may name uh, district level people, maybe social workers, it could be principals. So principals who may have, are no longer here still have to be named. Um, they ask questions in regards to do we have to ever lock down and for what reasons? And if, if we believe those lockdowns were due because of social media, like, are there reasons for that? Uh, number two, the partnership with Studer Education. Yes. So um, as we start thinking about our plans for the future, I would like to begin planning for 
SY30. I know it sounds like it's far away, but it's really not. Uh, when I started here in 2001, our admin, First Park Partners, district level, and I worked hard on getting a strategic plan ready to go. And I'm very proud of everyone's input into work with our um, SY26 strategic plan. I would like to now work with someone that can see things from the outside. I would like to partner with Studer Education. I have shared with the board attachments from Studer as well as in your board packet. And Studer Education's mission is to elevate all K-12 communities to sustain and um, have equitable excellence in culture, engagement, service to stakeholders, and outcomes. They work with districts to implement improvement practices that impact the entire system, from the district to the classroom. This partnership will continue advancing our leadership capacity to further strengthen the culture, systems, and structures, and best leadership and instructional practices that lead to improved and equitable student outcomes that are aligned and consistent across District 91. Studer would support with admin district retreats, admin professional learning, supporting with developing a new strategic plan for SY30, and guidance with addressing the right metrics. Huron Studer Education recommends a multi-year engagement to accomplish the goals set forth. Um, it would be from June 1st, 2024 to April 30th, 2027. They also provide an opt-out section at any time. The proposal's opt-out language is very generous and would allow for the district to terminate services should the ensemble in place now or in the future see the need to do so for any reason. And it reads, we serve at the pleasure of the superintendent and as such, you may request to discontinue the service of Huron Studer Education if at any time during our engagement you are not satisfied with the services. And likewise, if Huron Studer Education determines at any time that the district will not achieve its results, we will discuss this with you to adjust our work plan or withdraw further, uh, without further in invoicing. And then the annual fee for disengagement um, would be 48400 and the professional fee uh, with the invoice is 13000 That's where I'm at right now, just for discussion. And I'll wait for any questions. Do we have a specific statement of work from them, or is this more the materials that you've sent us previously about So the, the statement of work uh, was in that three-year plan, so working with us for our retreat, um, providing us, so we, they would not provide a template. We already have our own district uh, improvement plan template with metrics. However, they would be looking at it and, and uh, allowing us to tweak it, tell us what we need to do. They would also be working with our administrators and their school improvement plans for their alignment to make sure that they're aligned with our district plan as we move forward to SY30. Question, because I wrote it down. So it's 48,000 plus the additional 13? For the professional fee, yes. Okay, and then do you know, if do they invoice monthly? They in invoice monthly, yes. Okay. Okay. Have you looked into other professional services organizations to see, like, I'm wondering, I don't know what I'm talking about, but my gut <laughs> says that this is, that feels high to me. Well, and I should say that when you first started and we were thinking about the STRAT plan, I did actually look into some. And so I'm just wondering, I know the cost alone feels big to me. Yes, it's for three years. The cost alone feels big to me, and so I'm wondering, yeah, could we, I, I think that I would, this would better crystallize for me if there were, if I could see maybe some other organizational proposals. Yeah. What, what made you choose them? I attended a conference. I know the coaches there, too. Yeah. Um, I feel... Um, confident with them. I have also reached out to others who were using them mm -hmm. and have uh, mentioned to me that they were using another, as you mentioned, and they just felt this was the right fit. Mm -hmm. They also had mentioned to me that, you know, sometimes when you bring outsiders in, staff might be like, oh my God, what, what's happening? That their teachers themselves were saying, we want them to come back more. That was like a big seller for me because I don't want um, our staff feeling uncomfortable. I want coaching that's actually, you know, listen to us, listen to our staff and our needs. 
So um, hearing that um, was more of a convincing for me. What do you think that they bring that we cannot do for ourselves with our current level of expertise? The only thing I can think, no, there's a lot, actually. <laughs> uh, first of all, we could go ahead and do our strategic plan all over again. However, I do believe that having someone from the outside to see if we're actually moving in the direction we really want to go will we'll give us some insight. We'll actually see us, where are we stuck? Um, what are the gaps? Um, I also believe that having the professional learning of an alignment with our principles. So once we did our strategic plan, yes, we do our goals on there. And then we have uh, Director Edler and the coaches provide that. But think about if someone's out there kind of like letting them know, like, here, this is one way you should be moving in this direction. It's, it's just a lot for me to think about. As, we, as we're thinking about the ELA curriculum, that alignment, it, alignment is everything. Do they have... I mean, obviously, they, we're not the only school district, so they work with other school districts. Mm -hmm. They're going to be bringing best practices in and telling us, hey, you're putting together a strategic plan. You know, you're biting off more than you can chew. You could do more here. Like, they're, that's part right. of it. They would give us a coach um, that would fit with us, obviously, and would meet with us. Um, so with the admin, with myself, with the district level, and sometimes with the school leadership ensemble as well. I'm assuming as they are working to help put a strategic plan together, are they working with our data strategists and other things to take in some of this information and also gain some community data as well to help oh, that yeah. we may not have access to? Yeah, so they would do surveys. They would do it with our community. They would actually do the board as well. They would do a survey for the teachers so to, you know, to find out, you know, what exactly we're looking at exactly. And there was something else you mentioned. Um, I'm losing my train of thought. External community data. Because, I, I mean, you know, we have said we wanted to grow as a district, but we can only do so much. Our community also plays a big role into that. Sure. How are they going to bring in that piece of data and actions, I guess, that allow us to get to that goal? Yeah. As of right now, the surveys would start, and then from there, they would start moving forward with what else is needed. Um, but they would re really work with our data strategists as well. I mean, we may be looking at certain metrics, and then they'll be looking at saying, well, have you decided to use this one instead, or just focus on these following, and this is what will move us more. So those are things that they may, they're going to bring to us. I think for me, um, I love the idea of forward thinking and uh, thinking big for our district. And I think our, your formulation with the team of the strategic plan has been so helpful in providing direction and structure. I just like... I'm having a hard time wrapping my brain around 2030, only because I think our dist we have so many goals around our district, but also there's so many things to to John's point that I'm like, are we are we going to have 200 more kids? Are we going to have? I don't want to say the opposite. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Are we going to are we going to be in a current enrollment state? Are we going to have like? I feel like there's just still so much to be determined. I mean, I immediately thought, wow, a current eighth grader could be in their second year of law school by then. Like, that's how much time could pass. I'm thinking very ambitiously for our children. Um, and so I think for me, like, that's, that's what I'm struggling with is it just seems so far out. I also think there's a lot that can happen with staffing. Will this capture everybody's vision who is here? Um, in terms of w who's in our district office, what teachers are still here, who's going to be retiring. Like, there's just a lot of variables. So, I think that's where the, the tweaking comes in yeah. afterwards. I mean, a strategic plan, mm -hmm. even though it, it's developed, it's the district improvement plan that gets tweaked every year. Yeah. One follow-up question. Mm -hmm. So, thank you to that, because that helped, that helped flick a switch. For for student when they when they come in here, there's there's kind of two ways to look at a strategic plan, right? And you need to do both. Mm -hmm. There's internal factors. What are we doing internally to do what we do better? And then there's external things like mm -hmm. demographics, right? There's there are reasons why people come to this district or don't come to this di this district. Not all of them 
are directly due to this district, right? There's larger demographic things happening. Mm -hmm. Is some of what they're going to do help us figure out, like help us weed out what is it that we can do to, to change things and, and make things better? And what are things that are just kind of beyond our control, but we need to be aware of so that we can be monitoring them? And that's exactly what I'm hoping for. Like, what are we not seeing? And that's what I saw when I met with them, met with the coaches, spoke with the other uh, superintendent, like things that you're not even thinking about, like, huh, okay. So that's that's what I'm looking forward to. If they could give us an authoritative view, like a convincing authoritative view on how that's playing out, like th that dynamic, I, I'd love that. That'd be great. Yeah. So two questions. Uh, one, is there any district that is close by that is currently using them today that you're aware of? Um, where was Catherine at? Why he's looking after that information? Yeah, just want clarity. I, I think I understood. So, it's paid monthly. So mm -hmm. over the three year period, it'd be mm -hmm. about seventeen hundred dollars a month, and we have a pretty liberal cancellation clause. If we feel after thirteen, eighteen months, we can get out, are we on the hook for the additional dollars, or are we paying for the dollars up to the point that no, we no. use for cancellation? Only we only pay as we go along. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the full sixty-one thousand that you're talking about, if we mm -hmm. say halfway through we're done, mm -hmm. we're yep. only out thirty. You got it. Okay. And that was a question that um, Dr. Hubbard and I were asking as well. And I'm trying to Catherine Wing, I believe, superintendent. Where was she at? Close to Crystal Lake, so not close by. Oh, Graves Lake. Graves Lake. Oh. Yeah, that's where she's at. In an elementary district? I do believe she had high school, too. I could take a look at it. But when we started researching, I, had her, I reached out to her, and she was very complimentary of, of the group. She was excited about someone else looking into it as well. She's like, this is the way to go. So that's why we're like, we were excited about it, too. Was she able to share any artifacts or anything, like report whatever I'm sure. deliverables that they gave her that was she willing to share with you so you could evaluate them? I'm sure. Okay. I'm, I think it was Gray's Lake. Oh, Glenco. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I have her name, didn't know her district. Thank you. That's the best part. She's at Glenco. It's elementary. Mm -hmm. It's an elementary district. Okay. All right. Do you have a timetable for like a an ideal? So I'm really hoping that we could approve it by May or June because our retreat is coming up in June. It's the second week of June already. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't go by June, obviously we'll figure out how to do our retreat. However. It may look differently if we decide to go with them later and find out that what our retreat, what we did on our retreat, is not going to be what we're going to be actually doing. That's the only thing. Okay. Uh, number three, amending policy 7 colon 60 to include public act 103 0 0111, allowing staff members to enroll their own children in D91 schools. And that was exactly what we just mentioned. <laughs> so. Nothing more with that. All right. Oh, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. how, many, um, how, many ch how many staff members currently have children in the district? The staff members that have... Um, there's students in the district right now. Yeah. I don't believe we have, we have one teacher. Okay. Ms. Robinson. Yes. But then the rest are secretaries, um, instructional. And oh, yeah, Tanisa. Yeah. And Tanisa, our principal. Mm -hmm. Instructional assistants. So th I didn't do a number count on it, but I would say maybe six, seven. That's what I was thinking. Okay. Uh, B, Dr. Hubbard, um, 1 FY 2024, quarter three financial report. Okay. 
Good evening again. Um, just a couple things I want to discuss with you, and there's some other things later on that we're asking for approval for. So the first one is the quarters we financial report. Got some very positive news for that. Dr. Alvis, you mind just clicking to the next one? Okay. Um, so this is our summary for the third quarter. Um, and if you notice, our fund balance at the end of March 31st is $34 million. Um, we have finally gotten our tax money that we haven't received in the past like two or three years. Um, so that is money. That is not new money to us. That is money that um, we've been operating out of a deficit for the past couple of years because our taxes have been held up in Cook County. Because um, that one night that money came in, I was like, this is too much money. They made a mistake. And I had to call them and find out why they sent us so much money. Um, and it's from previous year's money that they owed us. Um, so bringing our fund balance back up to where it, it should be. Like as you see, we started off at the beginning with 28000 and we ended up with 30, uh, 28 million and ended up with $34 million. So we do got some of that money back. Um, so that's why we got a large amount of money in the, over this quarter. We, we normally only get about $100,000 in. So it, it was a little alarming to see it, but now that we know why it came in. Um, are, are they fully paid up now? They did not tell me that. They did not. Because <laughs> I, I did. I said, are we owed more money? Is there more coming? Is more coming in April? They, they did not have an answer. That's not even knowable, is it? No. Okay. Um, so what does that mean for this revenue, just looking at this physical year? Um, we are right now at the end of the third quarter. We got 104% of our revenue in. <laughs> and we're going to begin a little bit more because each month we get a little. Um, but I, I don't know if more is coming or not. They could not answer that. I, I, I honestly think, Mr. Rumble, they don't even know the answer to that question. So, um, But as of right now, we're in good shape. We got 104% of our revenue in for the, this year, and we still got a couple more months to go for this physical year. The next slide shows our expenses for the year, and right now we're, we're about 61% of our expenses expended this year, which is about right, right on track. Um, next four months will probably hit the other... 100%. We could do the other 10% each month. And that's normally just really payroll. And you always like to see how much money we have in reserves. So our reserves have went up. You see we got a lot of money in reserves now just because we're getting our back money in that we've expended for the past three or four years. Uh, and that's what they told me when I called them. That it's money probably from three or four years that you've been owed. Okay. Yes, Mr. Roman. So that graph is going to turn around in a year or two, so yes. be happy now. But It goes up and down, as you see. Um, they actually did not give an answer if we were going to get our revenue on time. We should get it this August. It normally comes in August. Um, it give you an example. It's supposed to be in August, and we got it in February of the following year. So they, they did not say if they got their system on track. One of the big things that caused the problem is they transferred to a whole new system. And when you implement a whole new system, and my understanding, people who are implementing this new system left, so then that just left them where they were. And then they also, we were up for an assessment evaluation, so that just, it's a snowball effect. Um, and at this time, each year, we do forecasting for next year. I was not anticipating that money that we got in, so next month when I show this forecast, I'll update these numbers a little bit more. Um, but just show normally April, May, and June, do a forecasting for the upcoming year as we start planning the budget. Later on today, I'll be asking for you to approve. So Dr. Alvis and I do start planning and working on the budget, and this is the first step of that, but just forecasting of what our funds would look like for next year. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. May I have a motion to go into closed session to, in, to discuss the employment compensation discipline, performance, or dismissal of employees? So I'll moved. Make a motion. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Who is that? Totally I'll make a motion. Second? I will second. <laughs> Roll call. <laughs> Mr. Lyons. Aye. Ms. Angelo. Aye. Ms. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Ms. Tyler. Aye. Mr. Rummel. Aye. Ms. Cotton. Aye. And Ms. Wood. Hi, we are now in closed session. Thank you.
Thank you. We are back from closed session. Um, we're going to go backwards a little bit. Um, back to number seven, the superintendent's report under the family and community engagement. Dr. Alvarez? Yes, I believe um, I did a typo. So I'm going to, he's going to bring it back to, there you go. Um, the parent response rate, isn't that better? Doesn't that look better? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Betsy Ross at 84%, Field Stevenson 82%, Forest Park Middle School 59 and Garfield 68 So I want to apologize for that. I don't know where I got the other numbers. Thank you. Okay, now we're going back to um, 11 consent agenda items, um, and that was as discussed in closed session. Uh, oh. 12 items for action. Um, SY 2025. What? Oh. Yes? Oh, I'm so sorry. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda that we talked about in closed session? So moved. Second? Second. Roll call. Uh, uh, Mr. Lyons? Aye. Ms. Angelo? Aye. Mr. Brooks? Aye. Ms. Tyler? Aye. Mr. Rommel? Aye. Ms. Cotton? Aye. Ms. Wood? Aye. Okay, now 12 items for action. Um, SY25 board meeting calendar. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion. So we are looking to keep the calendar as it is, second Thursday of each month, with the exception of July. Any questions? Okay. Roll call. Mr. Lyons. Aye. Ms. Angelo. Aye. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Ms. Tyler. Aye. Mr. Rummel. Aye. Ms. Cotton. Aye. Ms. Wood. Aye. Uh, number two, approving resolutions. For retiring staff members, may I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Second? I'll second. Okay, I have a few of these to read, so please be patient. Whereas Mary Hibbets has announced her retirement after completing outstanding service since 2013, and whereas she has faithfully discharged her duties in District 91 in a manner consistent with the highest professional standards, and whereas she has worked tirelessly to support countless students, and whereas it is the desire of the superintendent and the Board of Education to pay tribu tribute to Mary Hibbets, now therefore be it resolved by the Board of Education in a meeting assembled this 11th day of April 2024 that we hereby appreciate and respect the contributions of Mary Hibbets, and we wish her the best of health and happiness in her retirement and be it further resolved that this resolution be spread in full upon the minutes of this meeting and a copy suitably engrossed be presented to Mary Hibbets in honor of her retirement. Whereas Stacy Madgett has announced her retirement after completing outstanding service since 1999, and whereas she has faithfully discharged her duties in District 91 in a manner consistent with the highest professional standards, and whereas she has worked tirelessly to support countless students, and whereas it is the desire of the superintendent and the Board of Education to pay tribute to Stacy Madgett, now therefore be it resolved by the Board of Education in a meeting assembled this 11th day of April 2024 that we hereby appreciate and respect the contributions of Stacy Madgett, and we wish her the best of health and happiness in her retirement, and be it further resolved that this resolution be spread in full upon the minutes of this meeting, and a copy suitably engrossed be presented to Stacy Madgett in honor of her retirement. Thank you, thank you. Just kidding. Whereas, Lisa Marthaler has announced her retirement after completing outstanding, outstanding service since 2011, and whereas she has faithfully discharged her duties in District 91 in a manner consistent with the highest professional standards, and whereas she has worked tirelessly to support countless students, and whereas it is the desire of the superintendent and the Board of Education to pay tribute to Lisa Marthaler, now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Education in a meeting assembled this 11th day of April 2024 that we hereby appreciate and respect the contributions of Lisa Marthaler and we wish her the best of health and happiness in her retirement. And be it further resolved that this resolution be spread in full upon the minutes of this meeting and a copy suitably engrossed be presented to Lisa Marthaler in honor of her retirement.
Whereas, Linda Callahan has announced her retirement after completing outstanding service since 2004, and whereas, she has faithfully discharged her duties in District 91 in a manner consistent with the highest professional standards, and whereas, she has worked tire tirelessly to educate countless students, and whereas, it is the desire of the Superintendent and Board of Education to pay tribute to Linda Callahan. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Education in a meeting assembled this 11th day of April 2024 that we hereby appreciate and respect the contributions of Linda Callahan, and we wish her the best of health and happiness in her retirement. And be it further resolved that this resolution be spread in full upon the minutes of this meeting and a copy, suitably engrossed, be presented to Linda Callahan in honor of her retirement. I need a break. Whereas Jill Torres has announced her retirement after completing outstanding service since 2011, and whereas she has faithfully discharged her duties in District 91 in a manner consistent with the highest professional standards, and whereas she has worked tirelessly to educate countless students, and whereas it is the desire of the superintendent and board of education to pay tribute to Jill Torres, now therefore it be resolved by the Board of Education in a meeting assembled this 11th day of April 2024, that we hereby appreciate and respect the contributions of Jill Torres, and we wish her the best of health and happiness in her retirement. And be it further resolved that this resolution be spread in full upon the minutes of this meeting and a copy suitably engrossed be presented to Jill Torres in honor of her retirement. <laughs> Two more. Whereas Angela Pitaro has announced her retirement after completing outstanding service since 2005, and whereas she has faithfully discharged her duties in District 91 in a manner consistent with the highest professional standards, and whereas she has worked tirelessly to assist countless students and staff, and whereas it is the desire of the Superintendent and Board of Education to pay tribute to Angela Pitaro, now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Education in a meeting assembled this 11th day of April 2024 that we hereby appreciate and respect the contributions of Angela Pitaro and we wish her the best of health and happiness in her retirement. And be it further resolved that this resolution be spread in full upon the minutes of this meeting and a copy suitably engrossed be presented to Angela Pitaro in honor of her retirement. Whereas Vincent DeCola has announced his retirement after completing outstanding service since 1994, whereas he has faithfully discharged his duties in District 91 in a manner consistent with the highest professional standards, and whereas he has worked tirelessly to assist countless students and staff, and whereas it is the desire of the superintendent and the Board of Education to pay tribute to Vincent DeCola, now therefore be it resolved by the Board of Education in a meeting assembled this 11th day of April 2024, that we hereby appreciate and respect the contributions of Vincent DeCola, and we wish him the best of health and happiness in his retirement, and be it further resolved that this resolution be spread in full upon the minutes of this meeting, and a copy suitably engrossed be presented to Vincent DeCola in honor of his retirement. May I have a roll call? Mr. Lyons. Aye. Ms. Angelo. Aye. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Ms. Tyler. Aye. Mr. Rommel. Aye. Ms. Cotton. Aye. Ms. Wood. Aye. Um, B, um, one, consider adoption of proclamation honoring teachers for National Teacher Appreciation Week. May I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Second? I'll second. Discussion. I'm also going to start reading. <laughs> Whereas teachers make public schools great, and whereas teachers collaborate and amplify students' minds to further ideas, knowledge, and dreams, and whereas teachers keep American democracy alive by laying the foundation for good citizenship, and whereas teachers fill many roles as listeners, explorers, role models, motivators, mentors, and whereas teachers continue to influence us long after our school days are only memories. Now, therefore, President Wood, um, a, President of the Board of Education of Forest Park School District 91, 
Here's proclaims May 6th through the 10th, 2024, National Teacher Appreciation Week. We observe this day by taking time to recognize and acknowledge the impact and power of an educator on our students' lives. May I have a roll call? Mr. Lyons. Aye. Ms. Angelo. Aye. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Ms. Tyler. Aye. Mr. Rummel. Aye. Ms. Cotton. Aye. Ms. Wood. Aye. C, under Dr. Hubbard, one, recommendation to approve the transfer of $38,000 of budget authority from Function 2320 Executive Administration Services and 5000 from Function 2510 in Business Services in the Education Fund to Function 1100 Instructional Learning Materials in the Education Fund. May I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Discussion? Similar to last year when we submitted our budget, is we reviewed it and said we had a little bit too much money in Fund 2320 and Fund 2510. Those are the only two funds they monitor, so we have to transfer some of the money out, and we're moving it into instructional materials. May I have a roll call? Mr. Lyons? Aye. Ms. Angelo? Aye. Mr. Brooks? Aye. Ms. Tyler? Aye. Mr. Rummel? Aye. Ms. Cotton? Aye. Ms. Wood? Aye. Number two, recommendation to approve non-exclusive permit and indemnity agreement between the Village of Forest Park and District 91 for block party celebration at Betsy Ross Elementary School on May 31st, 2024. May I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Second? Second. Discussion? Um, this is for my understanding the best um, end of the year party each year. So Betsy Ross is shut down the street in front of the school and have their party. <laughs> Can I have a roll call, please? Mr. Lyons. Aye. Ms. Angelo. Aye. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Ms. Tyler. Aye. Mr. Rummel. Aye. Ms. Cotton. Aye. Ms. Wood. Aye. Number three, consider resolution authorizing the preparation of the FY 2025 annual budget. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. 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 Mm -hmm. Monique. Discussion. This is the annual time when we start preparing the budget, so this is the board giving Dr. Alvarez and myself the authority to start preparing it for next year. Roll call. Mr. Lyons. Aye. Ms. Angelo. Aye. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Ms. Tyler. Aye. Mr. Rummel. Aye. Ms. Cotton. Aye. Ms. Wood. Aye. And then number four, consider approval of proposed FY 2025 Budget review slash adoption and 2024 tax levy review slash adoption schedule. May I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Second. I'll second. Oh, discussion. Once again, given Dr. Alvarez and myself the authority to hammer out the calendar to develop the budget and the levy for next year. Roll call. Mr. Lyons. Aye. Ms. Angelo. Aye. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Ms. Tyler. Aye. Mr. Rummel. Aye. Ms. Cotton. Aye. Ms. Wood. Aye. Number 13, additional matters for consideration from the board. I do. Um, wanted to remind everyone that April 28th, our district is participating in the Special Olympics. Um, it's in Aurora, right? Yes. But I'm sure there'll be more information coming um, when we get closer to that date, so people should come out and cheer. Um, I have it on good authority. There'll be some matching outfits there. I'm not going to spoil it. It'll be spectacular. Um, besides that, also just giving props to the education summit that just happened. Um, I sat at the table for the district, and lots of people came by with questions. Um, there were other people that had tables that came up to me wanting to introduce, no, just have someone to say something, because they were so impressed, but they were actually presenting too. Um, and it was just, you know, being a you know, being at the table and just walking through it was great. Uh, lots of people, before it was even over, were looking forward to the next year and doing it and saying, oh, how can that go through? You know, I wonder if our district can do that. So it made a big impact. So thank you to everyone that helped put it on. It was great. Um, I took from that signing up to be a 4-H judge in the summer. So I'm going to better myself for that. Maybe Shannon will join me and Monica. Um, but it was, it was just a great, it was a very great event. And also 
the poetry slam that we went that I went to. Um, I had no idea what to expect, and I went there, and it was just like maybe like within after the first one, it was like, oh, okay, this is great. When can we do another one? Which is not going to be this year, but it just goes to show that all the dedication from teachers, staff, custodian, everyone is it's people are seeing it. Uh, they appreciate it. They're seeing our kids being our kids and shining and being great. So again, I want to say thank you to everyone in the district, community, kids, caregivers. Thank you to everyone because you make it kind of great here. Do you remember your math night? Oh, math. Yes, go ahead. Huh. Math night was hilarious. There was a lot of slime. There was a lot of math and fun activities to get involved in. Right. Uh, this Betsy was at Ross. all, it was at Betsy, right? But it's going to be more. Right? This was the first time that Betsy Ross had their math and science night. Yeah. So it was really nice to have that. As he was talking about the slime, I still have it in my rings. I can't take them off. Mm -hmm. So from massaging and making dough. Yeah. Children slime. had a lot of fun. Parents too. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. I'll be very quick. So Steve and I, presented at the educational summit, um, which was great. We talked about running for school board. Um, so if you weren't there, we would still love for you to consider running. And um, we were, it was really nice to talk about. It's nice when you get to talk about the role um, that we're like so deeply entrenched in it and you get a little perspective as you share it with people about why you do it, what's involved. So that was really great. And then last night, um, it's a busy night in the district because um, babies were doing math and science and slime. Big kids were talking about packing for D.C. So we're super excited about 4 that. 4.30 in, yeah. in the morning. They will be there a week from Monday uh, catching the bus to go to O'Hare. They are flying. They have two nights in a hotel. Uh, Ms. Watson is not playing about people checking bags. There are polo shirts. There's, it's, I think it's going to be really great. Their itinerary is packed. So send um, good thoughts to our eighth graders in a little bit. All right. Uh, may I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. It is, I don't know what time it is. 9.06. 9.06 and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.